Everyone would like to uh, move to the front table. You're welcome. Uh, there are some empty seats uh, on the left, front left table here. Peter, can you unmute for a second? And uh, let's test your sound. Ah, there you are. And the sound? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, we still have a few people outside. Close the door, please. Okay, welcome back. Um, uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed the first session. And um, this, this second session is, um, we're going to drill down and focus on uh, online campaigning or digital campaigning uh, and its connection with Prico Finance. Uh, because again, as Lena mentioned that we observe this as a uh, link that people don't necessarily think much about, not yet at least. So we try to promote awareness of the importance in linking uh, the act of campaigning, political campaigning, in the digital world with political finance, how it's regulated how it is uh, transparent, how it is reported, how it is enforced. Um, and uh, uh, you see on the screen here, this is the uh, cover of our uh, uh, research report in Asia and the Pacific, um, where we uh, connect and um, uh, the, the issues. And um, therefore, this today's discussion is meant to be a follow-up to this research. I will introduce the research um, in a bit. Um, and um, is it moving? Not yet. Yeah, oops, oh, okay, where is it? Yeah, so why did we do this research? So as we observed, there are more and more, well, campaigning, political campaigning is shifting from conventional means to digital means, right? While at the same time, we are, Countries are always improving their political finance regulations and enforcement because it can be a political threat, the use of money in politics, that is. So we feel the need to bring together, make the connection. And as I said, it's generally under-examined. There's not yet, until we've done it, a systematic study in the Asia and the Pacific region. Um, my colleagues, uh, Hushbu and Yuki in Stockholm, are also taking a look at this from a global lens and also 
working with other regions. Uh, we happen to be in Asia and the Pacific, so uh, that's where we are today. And also uh, uh, trying to look at how effective regulations or lack of regulations in, uh, in, in the region. So uh, I will skip definitions because Peter and Hushbu will be talking about them. Um, and how we did it, we, we did a death study basically, literature review, um, and also we use the political finance database that International IDEA has, uh, which is uh, aptly managed by Hushbu and, and the team in Stockholm. Um, and also we did uh, five country case studies. Um, we picked one for every sub-region. Um, and uh, so we get geographic diversity. And as also we picked uh, the two most populous countries, or uh, democracies rather, let's be more specific on that, <laughs> um, in, the, uh, in the Asian Pacific region, which are India and Indonesia. And then also, um, uh, other sorts of uh, diversity where we have um, uh, developed countries like Australia and Japan uh, to uh, um, a Central Asian country like Kyrgyzstan in the um, case studies. And um, uh, this will continue to be expanded. The study will go in deeper um, also in, in collaboration with uh, our team in, in Stockholm, at the headquarters in Stockholm. Yeah. So, so this is the uh, publication. So you can uh, scan the QR code to, in order to download it. So now the question is, why are we having this discussion here in Thailand? Um, well, of course, we have the uh, political finance uh, legal framework assessment that just completed. But also, uh, Thailand, according to uh, data from We Are Social, uh, based on the Reuters Institute data, uh, survey data, that Thailand has the highest use of social media as a source of news. Um, second in the world, which is 74%. 74% of internet users uh, get their information from, I uh, get the news from social media. And also it's the first in Asia and the Pacific. Um, that's because uh, Thailand is second to Nigeria, which is 74% in Thailand at uh, uh, Nigeria is 75% and Thailand is 74%, which is quite a high amount. And uh, this is why we, uh, we would like to start the conversation with you all um, in Thailand. So this panel is supposed to be an introductory panel to the next one. So the, uh, the, the meat for you is going to be in this third session. So Please do stick around. And as is its uh, introductory, my colleagues, uh, Peter Wolf and Hushbu Agrawal, who I will introduce in a minute, um, will be uh, presenting the global overview of digital campaigning and also uh, campaign finance uh, that's done online. So our, our first panelist is uh, Peter Wolf. He is a um, um, senior advisor at the electoral processes team in Stockholm, at our headquarters in Stockholm. And uh, he focuses on the application of digital technologies in elections. Uh, emerging challenges and uh, sustainable and trusted implementation of ICTs in electoral processes. Yeah, so he's he's the best.
person, that idea to speak about this. And then uh, on stage, uh, Peter is online with us in uh, uh, joining from Stockholm. So thank you very much, Peter. Uh, it's, um, uh, what time is it over there? It's 6, uh, 6 a.m., uh, 6 morning, 6 in the morning. Over there. Um, and then I have uh, Hushbu uh, on the stage with me, who, is, who has been working with me for a number of years on political finance issues. Um, so uh, Hushbu's research and work focus on political finance and influence of money and politics <clears throat> and uh, re achieving inclusive, responsive, and accountable institutions and processes. Um, and she worked in Latin America uh, for IDEA uh, before moving to our headquarters in Stockholm. Yeah. So um, let's begin with Peter, who will um, uh, share his screen and talk to us. I give the global overview on digital campaigning. Uh, Tanapad, you need to unshare first. Thanks so much, Ali, for this kind introduction. Just to check, can you all hear me already? Yes, we can. Thank you. Working for you? I think I'm ready to start. Um, so what do we want to do now? I mean, basically, as you heard from Adi, we'll have two panelists here, um, while Pushpo later on is going to focus more on the financial, on the um, um, money aspects of digital campaigning. I just like to talk a little bit about the broader aspects of digital campaigning that go a little bit um, beyond the money. So talk about some of the opportunities, some of the challenges, and some of, also of the emerging uh, solutions, including regulatory solutions, um, when it comes to digital campaigning. Um, so first of all, as, as I decided, it could already be useful to start by just defining um, what digital campaigning even is. So by that, we usually refer to the use of digital technology in election campaigning. And that can mean many different things. It can start from basic web pages, search engine optimization to make sure that your political message is seen based on search engines you have. But then, of course, a big aspect of it is the use of online platforms such as Facebook, uh, Twitter or X, um, Instagram and so on for campaigning. Um, then this area of using messengers, peer-to-peer -peer networks, anything from text messages, WhatsApp, um, Viber and so on for campaigning. And then there's a whole range of campaign tools as well that um, support political parties in entire campaigning process from um, data collection, from fundraising to data analytics and then the role of the campaigns. And then, of course, increasingly, we also see you know, those gray areas or those new areas, um, the, the role of influencers um, that are playing that they are playing in uh, political online advertising. Um, but then also the use of apps, of mobile phone apps, and some sort of ga gamification even of, of campaigning at some of the new ones. Now, um, of course, there's a great opportunity in all of this. Um, all of those digital tools are really not only new, but also very effect effective methods, methods for parties and candidates uh, to increase their reach, um, make this link um, to the voters that has been increasingly become difficult for, for partisan candidates to make and to enable ways to two -way discussions between the parties, between the candidates and um, their voters and their electorate. Um, and because of this efficiency of it, um, over the past decade, we've certainly seen a lot of uh, shift um, of advertising to the online sphere and a lot of transformations that happen. Um, so in many countries, what you see now is that the online space is the new go-to space uh, for political campaigning. Um, you see from election to election, more and more money being spent on advertising online and maybe uh, traditional advertising going back um, also because again of the big issues. 
And you also see a whole um, formalized industry now emerge in supporting political parties in using all of those digital and offering professional services around it, um, including all of those data-driven. Um, that, of course, has not only opportunities, but also several challenges. And again, later on, um, Kush is going to discuss all of the issues that this raises for the question of financing and money, how difficult it is to trace money online, how difficult it is to keep on track and uh, keep raising um, third party spending. But there's also a lot of issues that go beyond money. Um, just change campaigns because um, those technologies can make um, in increasingly opaque. It's becoming very difficult to establish some sort of transparency about who is um, putting out which kind of campaign messages to which audiences and so on. Um, there are very sophisticated target methodologies available that can actually lead to quite a lot of maybe unfair um, manipulation of voters. Um, all of this can contribute to more of the problematic polarization within many countries already. It can contribute to the spread of disinformation that we see in, in so many countries today already. Um, it can also support possibly poorly intended malign access from abroad to interfere in electoral processes. And the additional challenge is that all of this is moving very fast. So as election administrations, as regulators try to keep pace with all of those developments, um, usually technology is already one or two steps ahead. Now, all of this together leads to the risk that with digital campaigning becoming more and more prominent, uh, there is a possibility that all of this is jeopardizing the integrity, uh, the fairness of the democratic debate. Uh, it can easily tilt uh, a level playing field between the different electoral uh, stakeholders. It can hold to problems to the basic fundamental human and democratic rights, like the freedom to hold opinions without interference. Um, and of course, it can also be a very attractive avenue for possible malign foreign actors. Uh, for Now, of course, those things are not entirely new. Those technologies are not entirely new as well. And I think a big turning point when it came to the discussion of all of those tools was the year 2016, uh, where there was kind of a widespread recognized recognition in many countries, especially after the US elections back then and the Brexit referendum and the scandals around Cambridge Analytica, that something has to be done about it. And in all of honesty, and with all the criticism that tech companies sometimes are getting, it's probably fair to say that a lot of the action that was initially taken was done by the tech companies uh, themselves. A lot of this action initially focused mostly on the online platforms of the many tools I listed and I mentioned before. Um, it had to do with things like trying to restrict um, political advertising from abroad as much as possible, putting in the appropriate control mechanisms to, um, for this, um, creating those advertising repositories that some of you might familiar with, be familiar with, for example, what you see on Facebook, those, those ad libraries that they're offering where you can search and browse which countries, sorry, which parties have um, placed which political ads. Um, there was also increasing um, targeting restrictions um, and kind of the sophistication of the targeting tools that has been offered by platform has been now reduced a little bit. And then plat some platforms even went all the way to completely banning advertising, at least as far as they're um, But a few years have been passed since then already. And I think by now there's wide acceptance in many countries um, that first of all, that the, the rules for political advertising on traditional media are not sufficient to cover the online sphere. There's just a whole new range of, of issues of, of, of tools that are available that are not properly covered by existing traditional media regulation. But we've also seen that the self-regulation, this action that is taken by platforms, um, is not necessarily sufficient. Um, the problem is just, just that, of course, every platform is um, responsible for doing their own terms, um, their own implementation of those terms. Um, this can be quite uneven, starting from even the definition, what is a political ad, what kind of things are they reducing, making more transparent or preventing in some cases. Uh, the uptake between platforms varies a bit. And of course, you're always ultimately dependent, dependent on the goodwill of. So overall, there is a trend now towards looking into how can this whole area be regulated, um, tackling it from um, platform regulation perspectives, from perspectives of new regulation for online political advertising, 
uh, to some extent, um, data protection regulation is also playing an important role here, especially when it comes to targeting the use of personal data to get those messages. Um, but also a problem here is that oftentimes there's a lot of um, asymmetries in the information and the skills that are available to the platforms that have a lot of, of course, the skills, uh, they have all the data, they have all the knowledge about um, the issues that are out there and also the countermeasures that are possible and the regulators that try to follow um, with So what we see at the moment there are very few countries that have really ventured out um, into uh, regulating this online political advertising space um, a lot. But there are some pioneers, some interesting cases from, from which we can already learn um, quite, quite noteworthy are maybe the efforts of Canada that already started several years ago with this um, Ireland that has also quite an interesting ongoing process. And then, of course, also some um, regulation in, in several of those areas coming out in the European Union um, right now. The reason why this is such an underregulated area, according to some of the interviews that we had with um, election management bodies in many different countries, is that many countries, especially smaller ones, but also even larger ones, feel that they don't have the legal and the technical capacity to properly regulate in this area. Um, there is also concern about a lack of leverage with the platform. So there's always a risk if um, regulation is introduced that platforms find cumbersome to adhere to, especially if the market is very small, that they just withdraw from a market or that they, for example, ban political advertising. So this was one of the first reactions that Canada experienced at the time when political advertising was still allowed on Twitter. As soon as the regulation in Canada came out, um, Twitter actually decided this is too risky, complicated for them. So they ended up with completely banning political advertising at the time related to Canada. So there are some of those technical issues, but then there's also concerns about um, the freedom of expression. So, of course, regulating um, into um, the, the online political advertising, um, there, there's always a risk also that this goes too close into the kind of messages political parties are sending, the content of messages. And there is a very fine line um, as this regulation is being developed between again, preventing the harms that are possible um, on one hand, but on the other hand, also damaging freedom of expression, freedom of and then overall, I guess, as always, um, maybe even with financial regulations, there, there's in some countries also lack of political regulation at this point. But nevertheless, from some of the emerging cases of regulation of online platforms and online uh, political advertising, um, we can already so draw some conclusions about common provision that um, such regulation entails. And I'll be very brief about this, I, I think. Um, I've been deep, deeply into this will take a lot more time, but basically what you see in a lot of this regulation is that um, it focuses on, first of all, defining what is a political ad, defining the scope of what political advertising is online, and that is quite difficult to raise. So there is always this tension there between having a too broad definition, which can have killing effects even on civil society, on um, you know, actors beyond political parties, especially when it comes to this question of issue ads, so ads that are not directly about parties or by parties, if they're just issues that are maybe relevant for a campaign, should they be covered by this regulation or not? So that can be quite quite tricky um, to define. And, and um, so that whole area of definition is actually not really easy to solve. Uh, but then another question is, how do you identify political ads and advertisers online? Who should be responsible for responsible for this. Sometimes that's also not a straightforward process. Should it be the platforms that are responsible? Should it be the parties that have to declare every single thing that they're posting online to say this is a political ad? Um, who's responsible in case this detection of political ads or this declaration doesn't happen? Um, then provisions often focus a lot on the transparency of political advertising. That's transparency both towards the voters. So voters see what they're seeing on screen, understand that this is a political ad, understand who's sending these ads to them, um, understand to whom this ad is being targeted, so transparency towards the voters, but then also transparency towards observers, um, regulators, election administrations, um, researchers giving access to the data about the campaign, the, the campaigning online to all of those for, for more deeper analysis. And those advertising libraries I mentioned before are just a starting point. There's probably more um, that's going to come with some of this regulation. Um, another area is then what kind of responsibilities do platforms have? Um, do they, for example, have to establish um, a legal representative in a given country so that they can also be held accountable or ultimately will um, a lot of the relations with the platform still depend on MOUs and 
um, kind of good relations, which also is 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 needed in some countries. Um, do they have to do some sort of a risk assessment? What kind of data do they have to provide and so on? And, so on. and then finally, of course, a, a big area of concern is then always also the question of content and to what extent should content be regulated? Um, here, current regulation is very careful. So a lot focuses on transparency, very little focuses on content. And with content, there's usually this rule of thumb that what should be illegal offline should also be illegal online, but it shouldn't go a lot further than this. So of course here, there's a big um, danger always in um, risks uh, to, to uh, political freedoms, political rights. And so here it's, it's always this important weighing process um, and then a very careful approach is going to be. So this is our first overview of what's happening in the online space beyond political finance, what kind of regulation is coming. Again, this is only a starting point. We will have a publication coming out in third quarter of this year still, where we looked into the more detailed provision of some of the existing regulation already, draw some more detailed conclusions. So um, we can certainly provide you with more information as this publication is going to be out and we find a lot more detail there. And I think at this stage, I'll leave it here and hand over to back to Adio to put you now. Thank you very much. the broader challenges are the same and the broader solutions are the same. And what I'm going to talk about actually is not going to be fundamentally different from what Peter already mentioned, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on the financial side of it and just explore. Uh, in all honesty, online campaign finance is so rapidly evolving, is relatively new. We all know that uh, it is important. Um, the forms of campaigning has completely shifted in the last 10 years, and it will continue to shift more and more parties uh, all over the world are going to use this uh, methodology method of communication with their voters. But what we don't know is what is going to work, uh, what is supposed to be done. And our effort is to collect this uh, information on how are we navigating this. You know, uh, no, nobody has cracked the code as of now. There is not one country we can say that. Uh, of course, Peter mentioned Canada has tried, Ireland, Latvia, and mostly these are in the global uh, north. Um, but we are trying to bring those lessons learned and from the headquarters as well. Like Adi was mentioning, there is uh, Asia Pacific study. The study Peter mentioned is focused on Europe. We are also trying to collect information more uh, globally on what our oversight agencies doing, what our platforms doing to, uh, to navigate the challenges associated with the online campaigning, particularly the financial side of it. Uh, over the course of last two years, we have collected case studies on uh, Belgium, on Mexico, uh, Latvia. We are cu currently engaging in case studies on India, Brazil, Chile, and our, um, um, you know, overall objective is to understand um, what are the lessons learned in the process of as these countries are trying to bring some semblance of normality to the disruption that online campaigning has has caused. And I'm going to talk about some of the lessons learned or some of the best practices uh, that uh, we have uh, figured out in this process. Um, 
Adi mentioned some very interesting uh, information data on Thailand, and this is a global uh, picture. Uh, and this data has been uh, gathered from data reportal from July 2023 report. Um, and every single month they have, or is it quarter, but every quarter they have a report on the internet use, social media use, and we keep tracking that. And it's so surprising that every single quarter, the number increases by two to 3% in all of these parameters, whether it is a number of internet users, which currently stands at 64.5% of world population, uh, or is it about use of social media uh, users, which is 4.88 billion, 60% of the world population? How much do we use uh, uh, internet? Six hours, 40 minutes on average uh, per day. <laughs> uh, also good reflection for us, how much are we uh, on our phones and computers? <laughs> uh, and uh, within internet, social media, uh, Spend, uh, time spending is two hours, 26 minutes, which means basically all kinds of social media channels, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. Two hours, 26 minutes. <laughs> and it is highest among 16 to 24 years old, not surprising. Um, so obviously when the ways we are getting information is changing, the ways that uh, information will be shared is obviously going to change. And anybody who does not capitalize on this is going to lose in this uh, journey. So obviously, as a result, political parties, uh, candidates, campaigners are adopting um, online technologies and they will continue to do so. Uh, it started from perhaps the um, United States, which was one of the forerunners in the use of uh, digital campaigning, particularly uh, the first campaign of uh, Obama. Uh, was massive uh, in terms of use of online campaign methodologies, uh, but it has grown uh, in the last elections. Of course, U.S. elections are the most expensive, and Paul will know that, <laughs> are the most expensive in the world. Um, and their so social media spending in the last elections were $14 uh, billion, uh, which is quite substantial. But it was still a small portion of the overall spending, but it has increased. It was a very small portion, and now it is a lot more. So it is going to continue to increase, and it's, it won't be surprising for anybody. But uh, it does bring a lot of opportunities. Uh, Peter talked about it. All, uh, I mean, the natural uh, thought when we talk about money in politics is that it is bad. But honestly, money is given a bad name uh, without its fault of its own. Money is necessary for political campaigning, and without money, political parties won't be able to reach out to voters and to talk about their agenda. So it is needed to run offices, to pay their campaigners, uh, pay their staff, run offices, etc. cetera. Uh, but what is problematic is the unbridled use of money in politics. And same goes to um, use of social media. It is important. Social media uh, reach is much cheaper for political parties, especially for smaller parties who do not have massive funding, uh, large private donors, uh, new parties uh, who are still uh, trying to find their base. It is quite democratic. It's, it's a public space uh, with a mi very minimum budget. They can reach out to a large population at a smaller cost. Uh, they can relay their messages. So it is absolutely important uh, and essential and fundamental, but it does bring a lot of uh, challenges. And some of these actually Peter has already highlighted. Uh, first of all, is, uh, regulatory loopholes. Uh, our political finance regulations were designed in the 1990s or even earlier in many countries, uh, and they are not fit for purpose for current day campaigning. Um, there is always a debate when you talk about, talk to political finance experts, um, Every, they get very shocked when we say that political finance reform should be made to adjust to online campaigning. Uh, and it is a very big endeavor. But it is not a case in every single uh, scenario. And I will say, uh, share a, um, um, a table where we can see how regulations are working. But oftentimes, honestly, uh, the regulations are not sufficient to talk about because they don't define uh, advertise, they don't include online campaigning as advertising. As, as a result, it's a big loophole uh, which can be uh, circumvented and uh, abused by political actors. Uh, and at the same time, uh, online campaigning, when you when somebody engages in online campaigning, anybody can pay for it. It does not necessarily have to be a political party or a candidate. Uh, so if a country does not allow for third-party campaigning, 
the platform regulation should also talk about not allowing anybody but political actors to uh, engage in online campaigning. But oftentimes, uh, these regulations are absent. As a result, third-party campaigning uh, is done, although it may be illegal in a country, or foreign funding may come in. So a foreign actor can hire a troll army outside of the uh, country of election, pay them, and the regulators will never know here because that money never circulated the economy. So these are the some, some loopholes that can be uh, used. Uh, and the finally is organic campaigning. It cannot be considered as a loophole because organic campaigning is no different than volunteers going door to door and canvassing for uh, political parties or candidates. But at the same time, uh, oftentimes, and we were doing a study on, uh, as part of our case studies uh, approach, uh, we worked on a case study on Canada. And in Canada, one of the um, third party campaigner went on record saying that we invested no money on organic campaigning, but our reach through the organic campaigning was ten tenfold more than our reach uh, through um, paid advertising. So what is the thin line? Do we let it go just because it is organic and it is uh, freedom of expression, or should there be a limitation? Uh, when they were engaging in organic campaigning, did they hire volunteers? Did they pay them anything? How much money was involved? So all of these regulatory uh, loopholes need to be addressed somehow. Uh, and of, honestly, we don't have all the answers, but this is an opportunity for us to have a fruitful discussion. Uh, second, Peter already mentioned, so I won't go very much into depth, is the speed of innovation versus legislative reform process. Um, the ways we campaign, the technologies, they are just going at a speed uh, that our legislative frameworks are just not uh, apt to catch up. By the time we have caught up with problem A, uh, problem A is no more the problem, problem B is the problem. <laughs> so it is very, very difficult to catch up and play this game of catch up with uh, the new forms of uh, political campaigning. So what is the solution to this? Uh, there is no point in fighting this um, lack of uh, responsiveness, because legislative processes are time consuming. It needs uh, political consensus. Uh, it's a legal process. Uh, and I will talk about some solutions to this uh, in my next part of the presentation. Uh, but the idea is to make legislation broad enough uh, to not be specific to a certain form of campaigning or, or certain ways uh, money is being spent, but make, make it all encompassing that even though if new technology in the future, AI comes into elections or political parties start using artificial intelligence for campaigning or for, which they're already using, but maybe in a bigger, uh, you know, um, larger scope. Um, so make <clears throat> legislation broader to encompass for, uh, you know, bigger issues. Uh, then the information disclosure by platforms. Um, I was listening to a presentation by somebody from Meta, uh, and a lot has changed uh, in the last five years on how Meta or Facebook ad library, as we popularly know, as, has evolved its processes on how it is uh, you know, making ads transparent and making sure that they are following the legislation of the country. But again, what Peter mentioned, we can't uh, you know, hold legislation uh, as a responsibility of platforms, because platform, platforms are not responsible for regulating, self-regulating themselves. It should, it should be uniform for all kinds of platforms, because currently, uh, I'll give example of just Meta and Google. They're very different in their approach to political advertising. They're also very different in their approach to how they are um, making um, the financial aspect transparent on who is paying for the advertisement, how much was it spent. Just the definition is very different. Facebook has a broader definition of uh, political ads. For example, it includes, includes social ads and issue ads as political ads, whereas Google does not. And there are some platforms that don't define political ads at all. And this is important because this has implication for how much money was spent on uh, political advertising. Um, then capacity of oversight um, agencies. The scale is massive. Um, so our oversight agencies were already struggling in the analog world. And now with the new uh, 
technologies and uh, the amount of money that is being spent, or just even not the amount, but the scale of campaigning that is happening online, it is just very difficult for many of our oversight agencies to be able to conduct that investigative uh, reporting and making sure that what the political parties are actually reporting is what they actually spent. Uh, it is again related to the information disclosure by platforms because um, ad libraries are not available in all countries and they're also not available in the same format in every country. So uh, oversight capacities, the human resources uh, lack the training or the capacity or the time. Uh, often oversight agencies uh, focusing on political finance have very small teams and very small budgets. Uh, and there are exceptions, like Mexico is a massive exception. They have a very, very big team uh, and they are one of actually countries that are doing a little better in compared to others, but such kind of uh, uh, funding is not available uh, to every oversight agency and it's very difficult to keep that monitoring. And finally is interagency coordination. So when we talk about online campaign finance, it's not just one uh, body that is responsible or one body that is engaged. There's a lot of uh, parties involved in this. There is, of course, the oversight agency. There's the advertising council. There is the issue of uh, uh, the courts, probably, and also uh, PR agencies. There are private companies for and social media platforms. So there's a host of uh, different um, agencies that are involved, and oftentimes they don't have interconnectivity, and they don't talk among each other, and it's very difficult to uh, have those kind of coordination uh, mechanisms put in place when all their lives they have worked in silos. So these were some of the challenges. Um, um, so in each of these challenges, I will go very quickly on these five challenges, what are uh, possible solutions or best practices, uh, and what we have noticed in our case studies that we have conducted uh, so far. There are four contexts of regulation. Um, and when I was talking that people get shocked when we say our oversight agencies or uh, policymakers are like, but it's not possible to change our entire regulation just because uh, one aspect of campaigning is not involved. So we kind of put in a um, continuum of uh, what kind of, uh, there are four contexts of regulations. It could be context one is political advertisements, uh, is in general is largely unregulated. Um, and I, I have to give example of Sweden because uh, I come from there. In Sweden, actually, political finance is very, very loosely regulated. Uh, they believe in uh, self-transparency and uh, trust in the system. So the regulation is actually quite lax. It was good in the past, but uh, recently we have seen scandals appearing, political finance, finance scandals in, in Sweden. So does it work? Does it not work? Uh, is a question that I'm not qualified to answer at the moment. But uh, these are the countries in, in which generally um, there is no regulation of, no proper regulation of political finance uh, in general, but also online campaigning in particular. Then there is context too, in which political advertising regulation is limited to selected media. Online ad advertising is not covered. Like I mentioned, the definition itself, if, does, if it does not include online campaigning as one of the campaigning methodology, then obviously there is a need to uh, refine the process and make it more explicit uh, so that it becomes important for political parties or paramount for them to report on uh, money spent on online campaigning. The context three is uh, generic political advertising regulation applied to online political advertising. Pretty much similar rules apply to both online and offline, uh, but traditional media rules translate poorly to speed, scale, and nature of online advertising, as I mentioned, because they are, the nature is very different, the reach is very different, the scope is very different. So although the generic rules may apply, but they will be poorly translated. And finally, there is online advertising is explicitly regulated. So in case of Canada, in case of Latvia, uh, they specifically mentioned now with their uh, new changes, new reforms, that online advertising is actually a very specific form of advertising and these are the re regulations that apply to them. This is how political parties should be reporting on them. Uh, so this is a continuum. But like I mentioned, it's not always very easy to regulate uh, uh, and change regulations. So what can be done? There are soft law options, uh, which we have noticed, uh, which are being done in many countries. Uh, they are, of course, they are soft law, they're very difficult to impose or enforce, uh, but they can come in the form of codes of conduct, practices, <laughs> and or ethics. So it is basically a commitment to, uh, diff a commitment to different levels of behavioral standards. For example, political parties may sign a code of conduct to 
um, uh, promising or committing not to uh, use uh, inauthentic behavior or not to spread this information or committing to make their spending transparent. So it is not enforceable, but it is a, 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 not a very right word to use, gentleman's agreement. Uh, and uh, there is an open dialogue involved. And uh, although it is not enforceable, it does create a common ground. And uh, uh, if one person breaks the promise, it just uh, is going to crumble the system. So there is a little bit of pressure, peer pressure to follow. Then second is memorandums of understanding between oversight agencies and platforms. This is also popularly being used. In our case studies, we have uh, uh, in almost all countries that are trying to regulate, this is one of the first steps that is being taken uh, to start having these conversations with uh, social media platforms, having meetings, um, and you know, asking them to adapt their ad libraries or their uh, transparency procedures in line with the regulations of the country and this can be done through memorandum of uh, understanding between these agencies and finally is guidance on best practices and standards released by oversight bodies so even if there is no regulation a specific regulation oversight agencies could uh, you know develop these kind of guidelines for political actors that they can follow because oftentimes parties candidates third parties uh, are not very sure on what is expected of them when they are uh, using these kind of platforms for, for advertising. Uh, finally, I, I, I'm not going to go into very detail about improving transparency because Peter did talk about it, uh, but there is conversations about having uniform rules for platforms. Uh, for example, labeling ads uh, and what kind of information to include when you're labeling ad, who, who is advertising, who paid for the advertise, advertisement, um, how long was the advertisement run? Uh, and uh, what was the targeting criteria used? Um, how, what was the audience reach? And what was the total spending? So this kind of information should be required by all platforms to be included in their uh, ads uh, when they uh, release an ad uh, on political advertising. And then uh, requirements to disapprove advertisement from any unauthorized sources. Uh, and uh, again, when I mentioned, some are doing better than the other. Uh, but it's not uniform because, of course, there's no proper legislation on them. So there has to be, um, through this memorandum of understandings or conversations, oversight agencies are talking with uh, um, social media platforms to have these kind of uh, requirements that if uh, elections are happening in Thailand, only people based in Thailand should be able to pay for an advertisement. It should not come from any foreign sources. There should not be you no know, cross-border transaction, for example. Or if a third party is not allowed to um, campaign in, um, in the country, then nobody other than um, the political party representative or candidate should be able to pay for the advertisement. So stuff like that, you know. Um, and uh, reporting by political parties as well, um, ensuring that they are doing itemized reporting rather than just saying that uh, 100 million were spent on, uh, on advertisement, but where did the 100 million go? What kind of advertising happened? Uh, bookkeeping of online activities. And these are just, uh, you know, uh, best practices that can be done, uh, not necessarily always enforced by regulations, but, uh, you know, following transparency standards. And online reporting, uh, we talked about Thailand and uh, how it would, be, it would be nice if we have a online reporting and disclosure of uh, uh, donations and spending. And it, of course, translates to online campaigning as well. It is no different. Uh, it allows uh, for voters to see where the money is going, where the money is coming from, how much was spent on, uh, on the um, online ads. And then capacity uh, needs to be developed of oversight agencies. Investment needs to be made in uh, human resource capacity development. Uh, people who are responsible for uh, financial audit uh, of political parties need to be trained. And this training should also happen within the political parties, not just the oversight agencies, because they are the ones who are actually going to report. So this kind of capacity building activity should be done. Um, and uh, resources. Uh, and oversight body is only good enough if it has the right mandate, it has the human resources, uh, the technical capacity, but also the financial resources. Like I mentioned, some uh, agencies are much more resourced than others, uh, but without proper human resources capacity, it's very difficult for them to now you know, go into this wild west of online campaigning and uh, making sure that everything is being done by rules. 
And finally, um, when I talked about the challenges of interagency coordination, there has to be a whole of society approach. And honestly, all of these solutions are not um, a magic wand just for online campaigning. This can also apply to overall political finance uh, you know, uh, improvements, uh, but also whole of society approach. But if you want to address the issue of uh, transparency in online campaigning, it is very, very important that everybody work together, uh, including civil society. A lot was talked about the role civil society can play in, in our morning session and how in Thailand we do not have that culture yet of involving civil society. But without the engagement of civil society, independent media, and private sector, it's very difficult to achieve what we aim to achieve in terms of transparency. Um, because if civil society is able to track what is being done by parties, they can make them accountable, they can raise the issues, they can lobby for better transparency mechanisms, and so, is, so can in, an independent media. Uh, an example, just I, I, um, uh, I said when uh, also governments are talking to uh, social media companies, uh, they should um, collaborate with them to make sure that uh, their ad libraries are more uh, uh, you know, comprehensive, uh, downloadable, um, and uh, has a proper breakdown, and so is the sources of all the information. So it, it requires a lot of coordination. It just it is not going to be solved by um, one or two group of uh, people. So this is uh, from me, very generic. Uh, our case studies are all available on our website uh, of uh, International Idea. We curate all our um, digitalization work on money and politics on, on this website. So you can go through it, you can read, and we'll, we continuously keep updating. Our overall objective eventually is to take these case studies and develop a report. Uh, not going to be coming anytime soon like Peter's, but uh, maybe over the next years to to collect these evidence and uh, lessons learned and best practices from different countries and come up with, uh, uh, with something that can be useful for other jurisdictions who are trying to uh, work uh, and navigate this, uh, this phenomenon. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, Shushpu. Let's give a round of applause. And, and there you have it, uh, the two aspects that we would like, uh, we're trying to connect here, uh, digital campaigning and political finance. Um, I, I'd like to acknowledge uh, HD Center, actually, where we have cartoon uh, among us uh, uh, today. Uh, they have done a lot of work in this uh, in this space, so um, so we're not alone. Um, it's um, it's us. It's between us and lunch now. Um, anyone have any uh, questions? Yes, sir. Please. I have a question perhaps Peter can answer. So the simple question is going beyond digital campaigning. What do you think the impact of the new generation of AI tools will have on electoral processes and perhaps electoral outcomes? And as a follow-up, how does it impact voter anonymity? Thank you. Peter? Are you there, Peter? Ah, yes. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the creation, you know, bots is, for example, an issue that we've not explicitly mentioned here yet, but all of those mechanisms that are used for amplifying messages online, certainly all of those tools are going to be a lot more powerful if powered by artificial intelligence. On the other hand, there is going to be some sort of an arms race between, you know, creating artificial content, artificial amplification of content through AI, um, but at the same time, also those trying to keep pace with this and trying to use artificial intelligence tools for detecting fakes, for detecting um, those kind of amplified messages. But it's going to be hard. And at the moment, it looks like maybe the, the risks are higher than the, the solutions. So the sophistication in which 
inauthentic behavior, for example, you can create it online, it seems to be progressing faster than the detection mechanism. So detection always being one step behind. So certainly there's going to be a whole new range of accelerated problems coming out of AI. Maybe it's of a similar nature, but just with a lot more sophisticated ones. Um, there was a second part of this as well, uh, 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 anonymity of voters, I think, or of data protection and so on. Yeah, anonymity um, of voters. So that, so would you directly be worried about like voter data collected as part of the electoral process that that somehow would be analyzable and and like the secrecy of the votes would be threatened or that more kind of voter data would even be or citizen data would be more and more um, again breached and and kind of data protection would become more and more important. Because I, yeah, I, I guess if it's about the about the secrecy of the vote and so on, it really depends obviously about the kind of data that's being collected by the election administration. That might actually be more, mostly an issue with um, online electronic of voting, of course, if you know, how those tools are protecting the the um, identity and the vote and you know separating the identity of the vote and the vote. So I think that's almost a separate discussion. Otherwise, I think for the for, for data protection, we'll have to rely a lot on data protection regulation that does exist. Uh, many countries already. I'm not sure if AI is going to change that a lot though. So ultimately, you know, that's going to be a responsibility for all at least legal campaigners to adhere to data protection rules. I'm not sure about the Thai context, but oftentimes that is actually a major concern for parties. Now already, how do we comply with existing data protection regulation? How do we not breach this as part of our campaign? Sometimes, especially European Union, the risks are very high, the fines are very high if you're breaching data protection regulation. I guess that's at least one of the approaches that you can expect for limiting this um but yeah i'm not, not sure otherwise how anonymity would be directly affected by by the end. all right um any any other questions yeah <laughs> yeah it is uh it is lunch time now so um let's uh let's go uh on a break and uh we will, of course, uh, go through these concepts in more uh, closer to home after this session uh, on the Thailand uh, story session. So um, we will lunch be. Yeah. So uh, lunch will be at the. Yeah. So uh, we'll break for one hour until one forty-five. Yes. Um, so we'll be back here one forty-five. Thank you and thank you very much, Peter, for um, joining us so early in the morning on your side. Thanks, everybody. Have a great lunch. I'll have a good breakfast now. Yeah. Have a good breakfast.